Rachel to make sure she she was getting in, but I think she's popped in um, right now. So I'll go ahead and get us kicked off as um, Rachel pops in as well. Um, but welcome, everyone. We're very excited to have you here. Um, my name is Delaney Majors, and I am the manager of events and programs here at the DEC Network. Um, we're a 501c3 that helps entrepreneurs start, grow, and build their businesses. Um, so we know this is a crazy, weird time with so much unknown, um, especially in the VC and funding world. Um, so we thought, what um, what a great topic to kind of discuss and bring in some of our experts around the whole space, um, the industry, and really um, get a chance to ask them directly what is going on and what they expect to see over the next coming months past all this. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Eduardo, and he can tell you a little bit about himself and some of the panelists and get us kicked off and started. So Eduardo, all you. Yeah, appreciate that, Delaney. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you to our panelists for, for hopping on board and, and helping make uh, particularly the Dallas community, the startup community, the investment community, um, just be, you know, be alongside our entrepreneurs and our and our small businesses. So, um, appreciate you all being here. Uh, looks like Rachel has joined. Rachel, good to have you. Um, just introducing um, the event and the panel. So, high level, kind of the format we're looking at. Each panelist will go ahead and give a high level overview um, of their backgrounds, and then we'll hop into a couple questions that we prepared in advance that we felt the startup community is probably curious about, and then from there. We'll also, uh, as we present, please feel free to uh, anyone who's viewing to go to the chat and post your questions there. Um, at the end of the, of the kind of prepared questions, we'll try to get to as many of the audience questions as we can. Uh, so that's going to be the format there. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself and I'd love for each of the panelists to do the same. Um, high level, we'd love to hear professional you know, name, of course, uh, professional background. And you know what? It, what kind of investing do you do? Is it for a firm? Is it, is it solo? And just give us a kind of a high low profile of your investment um, thesis slash. You know what do you invest in? So for myself, Eduardo Zaldivar, I previously worked for uh, Deloitte in the strategy division. Made my way to a startup. Was there for three years. Helped grow it from three hundred thousand to twelve million in revenue. At the end of that process, joined the investment world. So now I'm investing on behalf of TXV Partners in early stage technologies companies, uh, both within Texas. And outside of it, uh, Sammy, do you want to give a high level? So uh, I'm Sammy Abdullah. Hi, everybody. I'm with Blossom Street Ventures. I'm one of the uh, co-founders and the managing partner here. We're a Series A, sometimes Series B investor, a million to a million and a half dollar check. We do a lot of software uh, or models that have a recurring revenue component to them. Uh, my email, if anybody wants to reach out, is Sammy at BlossomStreetVentures.com. I'm very accessible. It's on the website in case you couldn't write that down fast enough. Uh, that's it. Awesome. Aaron, do you want to give us a high level? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Aaron Gathman. I uh, recently started taking over running the North Texas Angel Network here in town. Uh, we are a angel network that is made up of individuals uh, that invest in early stage companies, typically you know, after friends and family and uh, before Series A, uh, so so before uh, Blossom Street. Um, as far as myself, I've uh, been in capital markets uh, for about the first 10 years of my career and then uh, started my own company. And after leaving that, have been uh, investing as an angel investor for about the last 10 years, as well as uh, doing some other things with startups. Recently started with Intan at the beginning of this year. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Rachel? Hi, I'm Rachel West. I'm at RevTech Ventures. So RevTech is a retail technology venture capital firm. So we invest in retail technology. And our thesis is that we invest in technologies that help retailers adapt in the age of Amazon. Uh, so anything under the sun from um, Excel Robotics, which is like Amazon Go, um, for all the non-Amazons of the world, um, all the way to Penza Systems, which is like this drone inventory um, AI solution. So um, we run the gamut. Uh, we're a pre-seed and seed stage investor. So um, first check size is about 100,000. And then we do anywhere between one to four million of follow on. Um, my personal background, I was in management consulting before this. Um, now work at RevTech Ventures. So if anyone wants to email me, I'm Rachel at RevTech.Ventures. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. 
And if anyone is uh, confused about some of the terms we're throwing around, please follow Sammy's blog. He's a prolific uh, blogger, and there's a lot of great uh, info on there. So shout out to, to Sammy. Um, we can just write, jump into questions. I think uh, a question that you know I'm, I'm hearing a lot, and I'd love to hear everyone's take on, uh, I think it's the question of the hour. Are you slash your firm still investing? If so, what are you looking for? Has that changed in light of COVID-19? Talk to us a little bit about what investing looks like for your firm or for yourself in this current state of affairs we're in. And whoever wants to take that, please, uh, popcorn, one or two can, can go, all three, uh, whoever feels like they, they can speak into that. Aaron, you're in the I top left corner. Why don't you start and we'll go down. Okay, sure. Uh, so yeah, there's, you know, in our situation, uh, being a network of individuals mm -hmm. that are basically you know, a lot of folks, this is this is kind of a hobby or something that they like to do. Um, so there's certainly a lot of uncertainty, uh, you know, that they're having to deal with with their other businesses or other investments. Um, so it's definitely a more challenging time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there there are some specific angels in our group that I continue to look at deals with, and there are others that have said, you know, they're they're kind of on pause for right now. So. Um, we are, you know, definitely uh, still interested in looking at deals that especially make sense given the environment, which, you know, we'll get into that. Things have, things have kind of changed. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll probably a lot more focus on fundamentals and, um, you know, being a little bit more conservative. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it is a challenging time, uh, especially for, for folks that are uh, very distracted right now. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense, Aaron. And kind of what I'm hearing is because of the network nature of of your organization, it's going to depend a little bit on a you know per person basis. Some angels are going to be in this time just be in a good spot, maybe capital wise, and say this is the time to invest because of the opportunity. And others are saying, you know, I'm not sure how this is going to turn out, so I'm going to play it safe. Is that, is that about a fair assessment? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, so some some people are are more opportunistic mm -hmm. and looking for things that uh, might might develop uh, because of the current environment. And uh, but that that's on a case by case basis. Right, that makes sense. And I think for our audience, those who are you know, thinking about fundraising, this is a I think what will continue a lot of time is upfront asking is Are you investing in this time? I think you can really help cut down on who you are pitching to and who you are not if you ask just upfront Are you are you writing checks during COVID nineteen? I think that can just save you a lot of time. And it's also an encouragement. Some are. So don't feel like every single age out there is not investing. It sounds like some people still are, which is which is a good thing. So appreciate that, Aaron. Any other thoughts, Rachel, Sammy? Yeah. Oh. You go, Sammy. Hey, so we're active. Uh, we are deploying million to a million and a half dollar checks. We want to be investing in this environment. Uh, you know, two things I would early one thing I would highlight is the bar has changed and that mm. for us to invest the criteria has become not only did you have to perform well in 2019, you have to be continuing to perform even through COVID. So unfortunately, that eliminates a lot of companies uh, that we would typically invest in. But given the uncertainty, uh, that's now become a new criteria. Uh, I wish it wasn't, but you know that's just where we are. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, and to add on to Sammy, completely agree. We're still making investments as well. Bar is definitely a little bit higher. We actually just did follow on investment for a few of our portfolio companies in the grocery tech space. So um, since we exclusively focus on retail tech, our two of our themes for the year actually were grocery tech and supply chain, which has paid off so far. Um, mm -hmm. So we're definitely still actively investing in those areas. Um, echoing Sammy's point, if it's not doing well in COVID, it's probably um, not the best time to be fundraising right now. But with the caveat is I think it's a great time to start building relationships with venture investors. Um, so I would encourage it, people to continue to reach out for sure. Um, I think it's a great time to build that relationship because investments aren't made in a day. Mm -hmm. So I would highly encourage that as well. Um, but just to be mindful that there's going to be downward pressure on valuations and um it's gonna be harder to raise for sure yeah that makes sense and rachel that that's always one to another question that, that i had for, for the panelists here i'd love to hear some uh this, this is a big question so please feel free to take it and, and bite size this if you will um i'd love to hear a general overview of how you think 
the venture capital and startup landscape um, are changing both in the immediate term, let's say over the course of 2020. And then do you see any long-term systemic changes to how you know venture or the founding landscape looks like? Or is it something where you would say, you know what? Yes, it's different now, but come 2021, it's going to be back to old normal. So I'd love to hear maybe what are your perspectives on immediate term changes and then long-term changes? Sure. Um, yeah, so in the immediate term, as uh, Sammy and, and Rachel both discussed, I think, you know, it, there, there's more of a focus on, um, you know, solid fundamentals financially for the company, uh, definitely valuations that are more uh, cognizant of the current environment. So, you know, coming down a little bit and, um, you know, especially on the on the really early stage side, uh, you need to be you need to be showing some progress. Um, so, you know, it's really tough to to sell an idea right now mm -hmm. that hasn't been proven at all. Right. Uh, you know, with customers in any way. Uh, so, you know, I, I think I think the trends that um, will happen now and, and probably continue in the future have to do a lot with uh, leveraging technology and just being more creative with how do you how do you engage with customers? How do you get customer feedback and show growth when you can't necessarily, um, you know, be out meeting with people in person? Uh, so the technologies that you can use to help leverage that um, and companies that, that are just finding creative ways to do that, uh, you know, will we'll have, have an advantage and be able to tell a good story that they're uh, making good progress in a very challenging environment. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I think part of what we're seeing a little bit is um, there's going to be a separation here. There's going to be almost uh, a culling, right? The startups that kind of survive this are going to just be very resilient startups at the end of the day. And if you can kind of survive COVID-19, I think that bodes well for leadership, for financial management, et cetera. So I, I do think, although inevitably some startups are likely going to fail in this time, we're also going to see a general strengthening of the, just a cohort of survivors, I think. And uh, like at any other time, you know, startups are, some of the best startups are built in a recession or a post-recession. And that forces just a certain level of perspective, whether it's financial discipline, um, it, it forces like, if you don't have a product that's actually meaningful, COVID-19 is going to be a really tough time. It might still be if it is meaningful, but it's going to be especially tough time if, if the product you're building maybe doesn't have a good fit and, and isn't really needed. So that's helpful, Aaron. Appreciate your perspective. Yeah. In the long term, I think structural, structurally, you're not going to see as many significant changes. But I do think that um, the timeline to that acceleration of these new trends has just advanced and skyrocketed. So you're seeing a lot of grocers and legacy retailers needed to have more online activity. And so I think they're being pushed more to build out those capabilities. And so certain themes, I think that would have been more of a focus area in 2021, 2022, I think we're going to be focusing on earlier. Um, echoing area in, in the short term, I think you're gonna see venture activity slow down just because the bar is higher. But in the long term, I think, you know, our doors are still open. I think other venture investors doors are still going to be open. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's a great opportunity right now. You're going to see new um, new ideas people come up with when they were cooped up for four months. Um, you had Stripe, you know, made during the last recession, Brooklyn and all different types of companies. So I'm pretty optimistic about the outlook in the next few years. Yeah. No, that's helpful. Sam, any any additional thoughts on immediate term and long term perspectives, VC startup landscape? Yeah, the Series A and Series B level, you know, the deal that I described that we're looking for, which is companies performed well in 19 and are continuing to perform well through COVID, we're not unique. Every venture fund is looking for that ilk of company. So um, as a result, you know, there is a potential that valuations for that type of business might actually go up. Uh, mm. So if you are a remote work business, if you benefit from this environment in any way, maybe you're an e-commerce business, uh, this is an interesting time to raise money. Uh, on the opposite end of that, that, I think there's a lot of VC right now that are not deploying because they're looking internally. You know, where's my portfolio? 
which portfolio companies are hurting, which portfolio companies are going to need a, 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 a rescue round, an inside round. So there's going to be some VC that are off completely. Um, um, net, net, if you're performing well in this environment, I think it's safe to go out and try to raise. Uh, you know, if you are being impacted by COVID, uh, that along with the combination of a lot of VC pulling back, at least in the short term, uh, makes this a very difficult time to go and try to get money. Uh, long term, I think a lot's going to change. Uh, you know, and it we started to see a change in 19 when Uber went public, Lyft went public, we work tried to go public, right? These companies were burning exorbitant amounts of cash and the investor community threw up, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, now, with COVID, I think there's going to be a, a doubling down of that theme in that it is not okay anymore to just light cash on fire for the sake of growth. Um, mm -hmm. Economic models matter. Uh, and so, you know, I do believe at least in the medium long term, uh, until it gets frothy again, that uh, building real businesses is going to matter again. Because uh, for a while, uh, it, it didn't, uh, especially on the coast, or at least on the West Coast. Uh, so those are my thoughts. Yeah, that's helpful. And I guess kind of a nuanced question, but, you know, I have heard a little bit here and there, a lot of a couple of entrepreneurs, maybe previous entrepreneurs or first entrepreneurs are kind of thinking, hey, is this the time to start my company that, you know, would benefit from the COVID-19 situation? So I'll hear your perspective on that. Aaron, I know you mentioned, you know, hard to, to get funding for a startup that doesn't have traction. But do you think it's possible? Is it possible that maybe those startups who are that are you know, made in particular to take advantage of the situation, would it be easier for them to raise than other times? I just want to hear a perspective on for the founder on the sideline. That's like, this could be my pants and my business is conducive to COVID-19. What are your thoughts? Is this, Would you say, you know, pump the brakes, let things play out a little more? Or would you say yes, because of the emphasis on COVID-19 um, bent startups, this is like the time to, to start. You couldn't find a better time if you are a remote tech, for example, company. What are your thoughts on on the sidelines thinking about jumping in. Yeah, I, I think that if you can tell a good story uh, during this time frame, that that's to your benefit. Um, and, you know, in some companies, maybe maybe it's just reorganizing your beachhead market and COVID has given you opportunities to, to launch that you weren't necessarily looking at before. Um, so I think, you know, un until a company is uh, pretty sizable. It, it's to your advantage to um, be as flexible as possible to take advantage of your best opportunities for, for generating sales and ultimately income. Um, so, any, you know, if you, if you can capitalize on that, absolutely, I would say jump into it. Um, and, you know, at, at our stage, before you get to revenue, there's still a lot you can do with uh, customer discovery and uh, just talk, you know, get, you, you can't get out of the building as we say as much right now, but you can still um, interview folks and, and get as much customer feedback on your ideas as possible. And uh, so that's, you know, just, just showing that you're being tenacious and doing whatever you can, um, I, I think is beneficial. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, I wanted to clarify. Are you saying people that are thinking about starting their companies, should they start right now? Are you saying people that aren't thinking about getting VC investment or wanting VC investment? Great question. Uh, the former, the, the, okay. the, the people who are saying, you know what, I've been sitting on this idea and it looks like right now is the time. For example, someone in the chat just mentioned, what about businesses that assist small businesses in recovery? You know, that's a good example of a company that maybe you have an idea that I, this is you know, a, a platform for small businesses to get. I don't know, funding or whatever, um, is the time to start. It's, it's kind of the question, I suppose. Is that helpful, Rachel? Does that clarify? Yeah, definitely. I think speaking as a seed stage investor um, in pre-seed, uh, I don't think people realize how much traction you actually have to have when you start in that pre-seed and seed, especially in Texas. If you go to California, maybe it's acceptable to have a little bit less traction. Uh, but in Texas, I think we're we're one of the venture firms that's as early as you can get. And I mean, we like to see signs of a first customer um, in a potential like completed pilot um, through. And so that's pretty a pretty significant benchmark. Um, so mm -hmm. if you're thinking about starting, I mean, I think it's great. Pilot it, start it, uh, see how far you can get. 
Um, but just be mindful that the timeline from starting your product, a lot of our founders, we didn't invest until they had their com- until they had their companies for three or four years. Um, mm. So there's, I think there's this whole misconception of just overnight success in venture and a startup starts at ground zero and then it accelerates in year one. But there's kind of a bed a lot of times of, you know, anywhere from six months to a few years before they even go out to venture to develop that concept. So in summation, great time for incubation, but make sure you incubate it before you go to venture investors. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's really helpful. And I think um, what I'm hearing also is, you know, you're, hey, if you have a business that you think you can start up and would do well and can pick up traction particularly fast, that's not a bad idea. But don't expect that to mean you're going to raise funding in two weeks from a corporation. Exactly. Exactly. I think it's a great time to try new things, but also be mindful of what world is, what the world's like in post COVID. So I think answering the question about businesses that assist small businesses in in recovery, I think that's great. My next, my next two questions would be one, um, if it's assisting those companies, is this a long-term play? And the second question is, is it venture backable? Um, those are the two questions I would ask, but if it satisfies those two questions, I would say go for it. Um, if you're a series A or series B company and you're performing well in this environment, you should absolutely be raising, uh, the number of venture funds looking for strong performers now certainly outweighs those that are sitting on the sideline in my view. Um, uh, you know, if you have a business and you're thinking about starting it, it's always a great time to start a business in all environments, right? Certain businesses do very well in recessions. Look at Shopify. Shopify exploded in 08, 09. Um, Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, went on to be the company that it is today. Um, Just do so responsibly. Uh, And I think that, look, that advice goes to any company in any time period, whether it's recession or good times. Don't mortgage the house. Don't take a second loan. uh, You know, don't, you know, don't put everything at risk. If you're an older founder with, you know, kids at home and uh, uh, the risk of failure means that you lose your house and, and you're really in a very tough spot, you know, I think you have to start businesses responsibly. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that advice goes, you know, irrespective of the period. But yeah, if you are performing well now and you performed well in 19, you should go raise. Uh Caveat to that, if you're performing well now, but you were okay in 19 or really didn't perform that well in 19, so in other words, you're only performing well because of COVID, uh, I don't think that's a reason to raise. I think there's a lot of investors that are seeing companies like that and they're saying, look, well, when the world goes back to normal, then what happens to you? Um, Mm. So anyways, that's a sidebar. Yeah, no, that's a couple of context. It's it's really helpful. And I think in some of this next question, some of it is going to be like obvious, but it's, I think it's helpful to say out loud. So we're just not assuming things. What would you say, if you your perspective from, from yeah, any of the three of you, what are some c- categories generally you know, of startups that you see being, you know, particularly successful right now and ones that are getting particularly hit hard? I think we can all off the top of our head list one or two, but I have to crowdsource some of those. You know, what are those that you're seeing? Maybe you would, you wouldn't think that XYZ is doing really well. But they are, or you wouldn't think that the supply chain, you know, down chain effects are affecting X, Y, Z, but they are too. So I'd love to hear maybe what are some startup categories and industries where you're seeing, yes, this is a really good time for this industry. And no, this is a, this is a pretty tough time. Yeah, I would, I would say, um, you know, as far as uh, convenience marketplace types of companies, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that, that, that a long trend since, since Amazon. And then Uber, and uh, now with a lot of delivery companies. Um, so, if there are specific niche opportunities within that that can do that in a uh, model that makes sense, because that's part of the challenge too, is a lot of times those those models uh, were able to attract capital, but then were not uh, viable on their own. Right. And so, you know, there's a different bar for that. Um, for example, you know, dark, dark kitchens, mm. uh, places that, um, you know, are making food specifically for delivery. Uh, that's kind of been a trend for a while. And, and I think that could definitely accelerate right now. Um, something that's going to be real hard right now is, is, uh, anything that you have to get your hands on. So hardware, um, 
you know, uh, CPG type things, um, anything that, that the investor has to uh, really kind of see and experience firsthand is going to be a challenge. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, I think the themes that we're seeing, um, in addition to grocery tech and supply chain resiliency, um, we're looking at a lot of e-commerce acceleration. So whether that's predictive purchasing, um, you know, more personalized services. So we're seeing a lot of how can you move the in-store experience online. Um, things like that are, are really important. Um, we're also looking a lot at re-commerce right now. So platforms, um, we were looking at a platform the other day that was like a furniture re-commerce um, system that helped save money on returns and get it to someone in the local area. So that was another company we were looking at. Um, so those are areas I'm very optimistic about. Um, and then I think one surprise right now, e-commerce is doing really well. We Due to COVID, we were expecting um, some of our portfolio companies to see a decline for some of our brands, but we've actually seen those grow even more. So I think people are bored at home and shopping. <laughs> but when you start seeing the trickle down effects of what happens to the economy in three months because of this, you know, that could be a different story. Um, so I'd say we're moderate on that. And then areas we're not investing, we're not focusing on right now um, is really that in-store experience. I think that's really important to do in the long term. Um, Short term, those companies are not doing as well that are pure play in stores. So we've seen some great pivots um, for that. But I would say e-commerce, supply chain and grocery tech. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, that's really helpful. And, and question that I'm kind of thinking through myself as an investor myself, I'd love to hear um, what are from, from everyone, really, as you think about your portfolio companies and as you stand alongside them in this time, what are the top two or three pieces of advice you find yourself giving to your port codes? I know I'm in the process of working on port codes daily and we're trying to, to keep things afloat and we're trying to, 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 to do well in this time together. And I kind of find myself repeating a couple of different bits of wisdom that are generally applicable, such as, you know, cut, call, you know, some, some are very obvious. I'd love to hear maybe, are there any two or three tips that any current founders in the audience you, you'd say, this is, a tip that I get, I'm giving to my port codes, and it might be good to say out loud here. Aaron, go ahead. We'll keep the order. Uh, sorry, could you summarize real quick? My my dog was yeah. in the background. Absolutely. What advice are you giving to? What what advice do you find yourself predominantly giving to your portfolio companies that you're supporting, and? Any of that that you think would be worth sharing with the audience here who includes founders of companies right now? Um, I mean, it's a little bit different with us because it's not we don't specifically have a uh, portfolio. You know, it's, right. it's individuals that um, invest in companies across. So there's not any sort of standardized help with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, yeah, I don't I don't know if we're the, the best option for answering that one. Yeah. No, I get that. I think, and in, in, I'll actually answer a little bit just because I just got off a call with one of our founders, and this is a very, just very fruitful one, something that I find myself repeating often. One thing that I, TXVR firm, um, we're in the process of doing is um, just cautioning a couple things. One, cautioning uh, largely freezing on hiring is, is, is the kind of market where we, we, we won't see exactly what the, as you said, Rachel, what the rebound looks like. Right now, we, we're kind of see, we know what, what it now looks like, but we don't know what three months from now look like and what are the downstream effects of two, 27 million people not having a job. And so a lot of what we're focusing on now is, you know, how do we, how do we freeze hiring but still try to you know, adapt uh, in that way? Well, at the same time, um, you don't want to be cutting people where it, it, later on they're going to be a very important asset. So right now it looks like how can we get creative around keeping the people that are just instrumental um, while also saying, okay, we know we're going to have to increase capacity. And what that can't really look like is hiring. So for us, it looks like being very strategic around talent management. And really, there's a lot of our founders candidly have more time on their hands because of COVID-19. And what I'm counseling founders is right now is the time to be investing in your team. If you haven't spent time with the sales team in a while, now is the time. If you haven't spent time with the engineering team and you haven't been updated on product specs, there's a lot that can be done even in the pause. So I think one thing that I would encourage the audience here who might be a company is 
there's a lot that can be done, even if sales are slow or non-existent right now. And the things that you do now will make you resilient um, as we see a turnaround. Um, another one that we're looking at is at the same time, uh, it's a similar idea. It's really hard to get new customers right now, I think, for a lot of businesses. But what's even harder is losing a customer <laughs> and trying to replace them right now. So giving a full white glove service, uh, uh, once again, this is kind of the talent management piece, members who typically historically worked on the sales side, we're now using them as customer satisfaction, customer success um, team members. And you know we're doing all that we can to shift around resources for two reasons. One, there's still a lot that can be done in this time by our team members. And two, of course, like anyone else, it's, it's, a, it's a very tough time to lose your job. And salvaging that as much as possible um, is to the benefit. So uh, those, those are the, the two things that we've given being counsel. And on the, on the fundraising side, one thing that we're just helping our companies think through is, you know, what does messaging and signaling look like in this time? Um, and for those who are maybe newer to the fundraising space, so often, you know, how much you raise or whether you raise is dependent on what the perception of your startup is. So if, well, for example, one of our companies was thinking about having an insider round, in other words, kind of this bridge round to get them through the, uh, this time. And we've just been very mindful of, okay, but what does that do a year from now when we're trying to raise again? Will people see this interim raise as a bad sign? And so just being mindful of the optics in this time. If you, for example, um, have enough capital to get you through 2020, but you're wanting to beef up the war chest, I, I understand that sentiment, but it's worth weighing that against, okay, but how will this appear to investors down the road? You know, and, and just structuring, if there is a raise, a raise in such a way that doesn't hurt you in terms of perception. For example, if you're gonna have a note, we've, a company's playing around with the idea of having an uncapped note. And all that means is you're not putting a new valuation on the company. So I think just getting creative around what is the signal you're broadcasting in this time of what you're doing? Uh, what is it? And how are you being mindful of that image? So those are kind of the two pieces of advice that I've been giving portfolio companies um, on that, that I lead and that I let investments on. Rachel, Sammy, any tidbits that you've been handing out to your port codes that might be useful to share here? Some of our tips. So I kind of it, to balance out the talent comment, I think even though people aren't, it's not necessarily good to hire right now unless you're actually doing really well due to COVID. And we've seen that too. And uh, some of our companies are actually hiring. So um, whether or not you are, there's a lot of great talent on the market. So it's a Absolutely. really great time to be scouting out your potential strategic hires and building relationships with them, even if you're not hiring. Um, secondly, it's a great time to build partnerships with different companies to say you're a startup and you're wanting to partner with Target. Um, a lot of people have more downtime than you would expect right now. And so they're getting very antsy on what they're going to do when they go back in stores. Um, so I think it's a great time to start building out those as well. And then thirdly, thinking about when we do go back in stores, I mean, it's going to be a mad dash. And so planning right now um, to make sure that you can pull something together if you're able to be last minute, um, that's actually kind of an advantage. And then um, two other quick things, offer free pilots. Right now, people aren't paying, so if you can get them for three months, see if they're willing to do that. Um, and then mm. finally, one thing I heard from our PR partner, Kettner Group, was actually um, if you're going to do press around COVID, not to do just this huge effort because everyone's doing that. Um, but if you are going to support people, do hyper-personalized outreach. So mm. don't – I mean, that we're here to support. I guess that's nice, but – um, unless you're doing something super substantial for the community, um, it's best to really be mindful of what that would be. Mm. Yeah, that's good. It sounds like just being uh, just being thoughtful and, and just not coming off as uncouth or insensitive in this time is, is a little bit of what you're sharing, which I think is, is very wise. We've told our portfolio companies that it's okay to lose a year. Uh, so some of them are doing very well from COVID, some of them are not. Uh, and so for those that are not, um, you know, don't do anything. Don't try to grow. Don't plow into sales and marketing to try to reignite growth. Your customer acquisition cost is gonna blow out. So uh, we don't mind if, if companies hoard cash and wait uh, so that on the back end of this, when a lot of your competitors are dead, and when there's a lot of pent up demand for products 
um, you know, you'll be in a position to, to take advantage of that. Um, everything else is, you know, I think pretty obvious at this point in terms of cost cutting, in terms of if you have a, a, a B or C player on your team, they're not going to become an A player in this environment, switch them out. Um, mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that's, that's the one big thing is just conserve uh, if this is not an environment that's helping. Yeah, no, that's really good. I think that that's actually a great point. At the end of the day, it's it's better to lo lose a year um, than it is to lose the company. And if it, it's just kind of towing that line. So I, I think that's a really helpful advice. Um, and then just something that you follow up question, Rachel, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up and, and you've spoken on it a little bit, but I'd love to hear suggestions around, um, as we all know, especially anything B2B, but even beyond that, selling is really tough right now. And Rachel, you, you, you made a great point around there's an opportunity to, do, to, to be doing free pilots. Any other thoughts, uh, Aaron, Sammy, on what are some recommendations you have for, for the sales team at, these, at the startups or at these small businesses? Any additional thoughts there? I think you need to focus on companies that are doing well. Um, mm. You need to go find the Zoom videos of the world. You need to go find yeah, uh, the good. customers in New Zealand and Japan, which have, you know, those countries have turned back on. Um, so I don't know if I've got a specific marketing tip, uh, mm -hmm. you know, other than to say that if your pipeline is, you know, all U.S. based restaurants, right, you need to you need to clean out the pipeline and fill it with companies that are otherwise doing, you know, quite well and that are onboarding resources. Um, yeah. yeah. So I do want to tack on one quick thing to there. I yeah. think that's typically good. Um, one additional way to think about it is for those retailers that aren't doing well, like restaurants, their pressure to innovate has accelerated. So they're scrambling right now and there's, they're going to have to change a lot to be able to survive. And so if you're one of those companies where you could be very pivotal, to helping them change and there's a great value proposition, um, that's just something to consider as well. Yeah, definitely whatever you can do to be innovative and you know, if you're banging your head against the wall and it's not working, stop stop doing that right now. You know, you, you have to find some some other way to, to reach your customers. Um, and I, I have a company that uh, I've invested in that does, um, it's kind of like a Yelp for B2B SaaS um, using people's reviews. So, you know, that's a, a different sort of platform that maybe companies didn't use for sales. So, you know, there's a lot, there's so many different companies out there doing things that you may not be aware of, uh, you know, just to, to figure out what other opportunities are out there to reach people yeah no i love and, that i think that's try that's try things out and see what works. i think there's and it, as, as we mentioned you know we can only get so specific in terms of general advice but we're, we're kind of seeing the gamut of yes if if your if your organization that you your typical target profile is i i don't know having like really great uh pictures for the food at the restaurant it might be worth thinking about what is what a different target segments look like and it's also worth thinking okay but if these companies are looking to add value and make sales, these restaurants might more than ever needs your technology potentially. I think it's somewhat dependent on the technology that you're selling. Uh, but that's great. I think both of those are great. And I think it's up to the audience in particular. Think about your situation. Think about the product that you're selling, your target segment of the market. And is this, is this a time to double down on your, your existing client base? Or is it time to try to pivot and, and rehash the sales strategy a little bit? So I think both are valid and both are potentially incredibly helpful. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah, no, that's really good. And I think maybe maybe the last couple of um, just thoughts here, as far as, um, you know, as it relates to, I think, positioning, the stars positioning themselves um, for the long term. And it, Rachel, and you mentioned this a little bit, but the companies that are in the, not raising, but are thinking, okay, I know right now raising isn't the best idea for us, but I, I'm probably going to need to soon how do they approach that conversation with investors? Um, a lot of these startups are are not having their best year and they're not gonna wanna hide that. How do they open up the conversation and, and not turn off an investor in terms of where they're at? So how does, let's say as a company that's doing 
okay right now with like most companies are at best, but they're thinking about raising sometime soon. How would you recommend they go about beginning the conversation with, with you as an investor? Is it something where you just kind of lay it all out? Do you do you wait to talk to them until later on? It, Richard, to your point, it's still a good time to hop on a Zoom and, and meet investors. But you know, what does that look like if you're not if you're not a Zoom, right? For all the not Zooms of the world, but that also aren't aren't dying and aren't dead yet. How do you recommend the middle of the path companies um, begin a conversation or even have a conversation with VCs or other investors? In angels, angels as well, for example. I mean, I think personally, it would be better to wait. I think it's very situation specific. But when you think about, I mean, I know for us, we look at 500 deals a year and we make five to six investments. So we're going to make the absolute best investments that have the mm -hmm. absolute chance of success. So looking at a company that says we're doing mediocre right now, but we're going to be great is not that compelling of a value proposition. Um, right. I think if there's strong evidence that supports your growth, I think that's great. But I think being very mindful of what a VC investor is looking for is probably a good idea. Um, so you kind of think of it in the terms of um, this is a terrible analogy, but think of it in the terms of like dating, right? If someone's like, I need you, I'm not doing well, I need you. <laughs> that's just very, very unattractive. Um, that's literally, Rachel, that's literally me. I feel attacked right now, but go ahead. <laughs> so well, at least Eduardo learned something. Um, but, uh, but on that point, I mean, if you have friends that are investors, I mean, that's great to build relationships, but opening up your books in a time that isn't ideal, I'd wait to be a little bit more strategically um, positioned and to really state growth. The only, the only caveat, if you absolutely have to, is to say, Hey, investor XYZ, this is where we're at right now. Here's where we plan on being in six months. And then when you have that call in six months, if you show that you've exceeded that significantly, um, that's a great sign. So that would be the only caveat, but I would say in general, waiting is probably better. Um, you know, Sammy may have a completely different opinion though. So everyone's going to have a different opinion on that. Yeah, no, that's helpful, but it sounds like Rachel, I, and I love what you mentioned. There's this aspect here of um, just being realistic and honest, but also painting a picture of the future, right? You don't want to go in there and say, things aren't going great. You want to meet up? That's just not, that's not compelling. But hey, we are like every other company in this spot, but in the turnaround happens, just wanted to, be, you know, Rachel just wanted to give you a company update. Here's how it's going. This is the, the honest truth that is going this way, but also we have reserves for this much. And this is kind of what we're, we're projecting over the next couple of months. We'll have a touch base, you know, come end of summer. And so you, they kind of stay top of mind while at the same time not having to put the emphasis on on maybe the current state. And then when that time comes and you've done well, well, you've they've been teed up now well because they told you this, Rachel, and they actually exceeded that. So I think it's a little yeah. bit of around, once again, you know, managing expectations um, and also you, just leading with the strength, which is here's how we see the future and because we all know how the present is. So that, that's really helpful, Rachel. Appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, if you must raise right now, um, man, I mean, I don't envy anybody that's raising in a normal environment. And certainly in this environment, it's terrible. Um, but if you must raise now and you're not performing well, uh, I think you need to just be very direct about where you are mm -hmm. with the fund. And so if that's a type of fund that's like us, for instance, that cannot or won't invest in a company that's not performing well in COVID, good. Let them know that up front that you're not performing well. You can scratch them off mm -hmm. the list and move on to the next one. Uh, you might focus on strategic VC uh, that maybe are in your space and have a mandate to invest in your space and have dry powder. Um, so who you're pitching matters a lot more in this environment, especially if you're not performing well. And then finally, you know, this is not normal. Uh, so. Um, to, you know, everybody's hurting. I don't necessarily, I personally don't hold it against somebody for being desperate in this environment. And if you have to raise and you have to raise. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're honest about it, you show that you're willing and reasonable uh, and, you know, will give up concessions on structure, on valuation, and you just recognize your position and you're honest about that. Perhaps you might attract an investor who will take that bet. Um, 
But boy, uh, fundraising's hard already. It just got 10 times harder if you're not performing well. Um, certainly if you can avoid it, avoid it. But if you can't, I think you just need to be very direct about where you are, you know, show that you're willing to give some things up um, and focus on those VC that are in your space or have been talking to you for a long time and know you pretty well. Uh, that's about all I could say. Yeah, you know, that's very helpful. I think ultimately kind of what I'm hearing is that obviously not easy, but if you're in a position where you have to, you can really save a lot of time by just being really upfront about where you are and just targeting that um, investor um, list of people that you're calling to potentially raise from. If, if, if one, you don't have an existing relationship, that's just going to be really tough to cold call an investor from wherever that's never met you to take a bet on a company that is not looking that good. So kind of prioritizing those who you have some level of relationship with or for some reason it makes sense strategically, maybe it's a strategic investor that's in a corporation, a corporate venture capital firm, for example. Um, those are the kind of companies that might be willing to take the bet in that it's not just valuation, but it makes strategic sense for them to partner with you. So that, that's, that's very helpful, Sammy. Um, Aaron, any final thoughts on companies that are at the earlier stage and wanting to approach angels, uh, angel investors, but aren't sure about how to approach it in light of maybe their current state? Yeah, I think uh, similar to what Sammy's saying, um, you know, you have to realize it's a buyer's market and you may have to make concessions. And similar to how to manage through this is, um, you know, be be conservative on cash flow. Uh, have very well thought out budgets that go, you know, very, you know, 18 to 36 months out because we don't, you know, six to 12 months, I, I don't think anybody wants to, invest based on what do you think is going to happen in six to 12 months. It's at least 18 months or longer at this point, especially if we were to have another wave of this come, you know, a few months from now. So yeah, it's, uh, it's building that trust, um, you know, open books and here, here's where we're at. Here's a very well thought out budget. Here's our plan. Do you want to, you know, do you want to join us? Yeah, no, that, that, that's plan? great. I definitely would echo that. And, um, one question from the audience here. I think it's a good one. How are you thinking about the your investment strategies with the potentiality of a second wave of the COVID-19 infections? Ha, has that been calculated at all? How, how, how are you thinking about, I think all of us know what right now investing looks like, and we also kind of know what recovery investment looks like. But what does it look like if you thought about this at all with the potentiality of a second wave of, 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 of infections and outbreaks and, and lockdowns? Is that something that you've thought of just yet? And I know for even for us, that's a that's an unknown. So I'd be curious to hear if that's something you've been considering at all in the investment strategy. Yeah, I, I think it you know gets back to what I was just saying as far as um, you know it's not it's not twelve to eight mm -hmm. month runway or twelve to eighteen month runway right now. It's yeah, double and that. I think I would just add to that from our perspective at TXV. Um, some of those have been articulated before, but we're, we're just not, it's a lot less likely for us to take a bet on a company that will only survive with a sharp recovery in three months. Uh, so even if you're a company that, you know, you're, you're struggling right now, but you know, it, you can kind of see a, a pretty big, uh, turnaround situation if the economy recovers and, and things are lifted, uh, for us as investors, that's still a risk because of a second or third wave potentiality. So Unless, as Sammy mentioned, we have an existing relationship um, or there's a, a really strong reason for us to do so. Um, we're just not willing, as of right now, to invest in companies that their success and survival is dependent on a turnaround. Because, frankly, we're just not sure right now if that turnaround is coming in three months or 15. So that, that's kind of our perspective as investors as it relates to the second wave, uh, the potential second wave. Rachel, Sammy, any additional thoughts or do you feel like we've covered the, the second wave scenario? I feel like it's pretty covered. I just think if it's resistant to COVID, that's what we're looking at right now. If there's a second wave, that's what we'll still be looking at. Uh, if there's not a second wave, obviously that strategy will change. Um, so nothing that changes from present, I would say. Awesome. Sammy, do you feel similar? I haven't thought about second wave because I don't want to. Um, so mm. it is not driving my investment strategy, you know, along with what everybody else said, if you're performing well now, hopefully you're performing well in second wave. And 
uh, hopefully if there is second wave uh, as a country, we're in a much better position to handle it. So perhaps the dip won't be as bad of a dip as we're having now. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think we're, um, this first time around for everyone has been incredibly difficult. Um, so I know for the people in the audience know that we're, we, we're, we're here for you. We hear you. We, we, we empathize with what you're going through. And I know that any, any of us uh, here on the call would be very happy to, to be emailed and to touch base if you're in a situation where as an investor, we could be helpful. Um, so I do appreciate y'all making the time. And with that, I'll give it, lend it over to Delaney for some final um, just closing comments on the deck. And just wanted to say to our panelists, thanks so much for joining us. Um, as investors, there's only so much we could do in the time of this crisis and, and lend our expertise, lend our experience uh, helping multiple companies weather multiple storms is, is a major way we can help. So Sammy, Aaron, Rachel, appreciate you joining us. Uh, and for the people that are watching, appreciate you hopping on and, and, and trusting the deck with your time. So Delaney, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Eduardo. And uh, thank you, Rachel, Sammy, Aaron. We obviously really appreciate you coming on and spending your time with us and um, giving such valuable insights to some of um, the people on the deck network and people who attended this event. So um, with that, like um, Eduardo said, we do have a couple other deck network things. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to post a link to one of our newest um, websites. It's called Let's Grow North Texas Business. That is where we're putting all COVID resources, whether it's event, events, um, discounts for you as an entrepreneur. A great feature on there is that we have our Fast Start Mentor program that we just launched. So if you're looking for more one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one help, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, apply to that. Um, we'll get you connected with someone really quickly. Or if you're looking to mentor someone, um, by all means, we're always looking for mentors and mentees. Um, so that's a great resource. But everything that you know we have aggregated can be found in that link that I just tossed in the chat box. Um, but other than that, um, check out any future events we have coming up. We do have a couple more um, this week, and we'll have some in the following weeks as well. Um, and always let us know if you have any feedback or any other events you do want to see because we want to provide valuable content to you guys. What I'll also do is um, put my email in there. So if you do have feedback, feel free to email me directly. Um, but with that, again, thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists, and we will see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.